<laughs> Thanks, folks, for hanging there with us. Uh, I am going to go ahead and start our introduction of our speaker for this evening. Really pleased to have uh, Hardy with us. So Hardy Kern is Director of Government Relations, Pesticides, and Birds Campaign for American Bird Conservancy, uh, a group that I've been kind of affiliated for quite some time. Uh, in the past, we've had uh, uh, folks come out and talk about birds and cats. And uh, so it's a great group. If you've not been involved with them, you probably ought to check them out. Hardy holds a BS in zoology from the Ohio State University and a master's of public administration from Kent State University. Hardy works at the federal and the state level on legislation and regulation aimed at reducing negative impacts of pesticides on birds and other wildlife, as well as other environmental contamination and implementation of the Endangered Species Act. He grew up in Pittsburgh, PA, and currently lives in Columbus, Ohio with his wife, dogs, and way too many bird feeders. It's my sincere pleasure to introduce Hardy. It's all yours. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for hanging on in there. I have had a literal uh, journey getting, getting in front of you all today, so I do so appreciate you hanging in there with us. Uh, my name, like Red said, is Hardy Kern, and because my camera now is not working on my laptop, you are getting this voice from this gorgeous picture of a great gray owl. Um, maybe it'll come online by the end. But today, in line with the One Health topics that are part of this seminar series, I was kindly invited to talk about neonicotinoid insecticides, which are a specific class of insecticides, and uh, we basically have been working on this at American Bird Conservancy for a couple of decades at this point. And thanks to the kindness and the generosity of the Rains Family Foundation, my position was created at ABC to specifically look at the impacts of neonic insecticides on birds and how we can reduce them. So just a little more about American Bird Conservancy. Reg gave us a fantastic intro there. We are dedicated to conserving birds and their habitats across the Americas. And what I love about working with ABC, working at ABC, I should say, is basically if it's a threat to birds, we have somebody or a team of somebody's working on it. So the pyramid here on the right is our overall strategic framework for how we approach bird conservation. Starting at the bottom, we like to make sure we have a lot of different folks and stakeholders engaged in bird conservation. We address threats to all birds, which is where my program fits. So it's pesticides, window collisions, conservation funding at the federal level. And then next up, we address birds of conservation concern. So we like to conserve bird habitat in both North and South America, as well as across North America. And then at the very tippy top of our pyramid, we have some special programs concentrated on highly endangered bird species in both North and South America. So when we're talking about birds, this is what we're talking about. This is a map of the North American flyways, which are basically the different bird highways, the migration routes that birds use to go from their wintering grounds in Central and South America up into the U.S. and Canada for breeding. There are, of course, many species that are residents throughout the entire year in a fixed place. But this map that you're looking at is what makes it so hard for large regulatory agencies to really help endangered bird species or even non-endangered migratory bird species. A lot of our federal regulation programs are built around addressing threats to birds that hang out in one specific area, which is their dedicated habitat, or one primary type of habitat. So we'll say forests or swamps or marshes, Migratory birds go all over the place. And specifically for us in Pennsylvania, I live in Ohio, uh, Columbus, Ohio right now. I do a lot of work in DC. We are over here in the Atlantic Flyway, which as you can see, goes up the coast, but also zigs and zags way far inland to the Corn Belt um, over there in Nebraska and Kansas and the Dakotas. And this is a really critical area for birds that are migrating north and south. 
And when we're talking about bird migration, this is from last week or two weeks ago, I should say, March 8th. This is uh, a fantastic free resource you can check out called BirdCast. This is where they take and they forecast the amount of birds migrating that evening. So we're still pretty early in spring migration. We're starting to see some species uh, coming up. You can see them moving up from Florida, going north to Canada. But in the height of migration season, we can see as many as 600 million birds just about migrating in the course of a single evening. So this map is a better representation of what fall migration can look like. And where are these birds going? Right through those flyways, but also right across some of the most heavily agricultural parts of the country, right there in the middle, in the Midwest and in the Corn Belt. And right now we are facing, th this is going to be a really uplifting <laughs> presentation, everybody, but I promise we have some happy stuff at the end. Uh, right now, North America is facing a loss of around 3 billion birds. That means 3 billion fewer birds today than there were in 1970. And that's 3 billion below baseline, not our normal up and down fluctuation. And of course, this is due to a lot of different factors. Folks have thrown out impacts from cats, from window collisions, from habitat loss, from climate change, and also from agricultural intensification, specifically from the use of pesticides and fertilizers. And what this looks like is one in four birds gone, one in four fewer birds at your feeders. And the two groups that have been most heavily impacted are grassland birds, about a 53% decline in their population. So birds that live in open prairies, as well as aerial insectivores, swifts, swallows, swiftlets, uh, fly catchers, gnat catchers, the birds that are built to fly around in the air and scoop up bugs. And there was a fantastic paper put together a few years ago by the renowned master gardener, Doug Tallamy, and his partner, Greg Schreiber, because the question was being asked, okay, we're seeing this massive decline in birds. There's been a oft-reported massive decline in insects. Is it fair to say that the two are related? I say, yes, absolutely. Most scientists say, yes, absolutely. But I have been in the room with different federal regulators who say, we don't necessarily know that these two things are connected, which is very frustrating in its own right. So what Talamy and Shriver did was they took all the birds that were found to be either um, in decline or the ones that were increasing, and they grouped them by diet. And does anybody want to venture a guess, you know, type it in or just hold it in your heads, what percent of all terrestrial birds eat insects? So think about any bird that's mostly land dwelling in the United States. 96%, 96% of all terrestrial birds eat bugs at some point in their lifetime. So we're talking about the birds that go to your feeders in your backyard, a lot of the ones that you see at the beach, the ones high up in mountains. Almost every bird in their study of about 364 species is dependent on insects, or 368, I should say. And when they broke it down by diet type, what they found is that for birds where insects are not essential, those were the ones that were increasing. This is a lot of shorebirds, some waterfowl that don't necessarily eat insects, but the birds where they needed bugs at least at some point in their life cycle, those are the ones that were in decline. Now, if anybody wants to reach out, or if anybody wants to guess, this is one of my favorites, how many caterpillars will a single Carolina chickadee feed its nestlings before they fledge? So Carolina chickadee are those teeny tiny fat little birds with the black caps on them. You can imagine they're pretty little. How many caterpillars do you think they need for just one group of nestlings? And the answer is somewhat surprising. Six to 9,000 caterpillars for one group of little tiny chickadees. That's not even something the size of a robin, and they can have two to four groups of babies every single year. And when they examined these in laboratory settings, and they even did some wild work, they found that when there was fewer bugs, fewer caterpillars for these chickadees to have access to, they saw smaller clutches of eggs, higher nestling mortality from starvation, fewer of them made it out of the nest, and the ones that did had lower body mass. So I think we're seeing pretty good signs that bug decline and bird decline are probably interrelated. 
Now, going a little more into today's topic, neonicotinoids, which are called neonics for short, they are a group of neonicot or sorry, nicotinic. Um, acetylcholine esterase inhibitor insecticides, which means that they are designed to slot into the part of a nerve receptor that normally the the, uh, the compound nicotine would fit into, and not just the stuff that you know. We're not saying that birds are out there or bugs are out there smoking cigarettes. This is something that's a naturally occurring. Neonic pesticides are built to. slot into a nerve receptor, their ability to have normal movement. They can't contract muscles, their organ function depletes. They do a really, really good job of killing bugs. And neonics are highly toxic in very, very small amounts. That's what made them such a wonder chemical. And so I put together here a little timeline to kind of take us through when neonics started and where we are today with, or with uh, reference to birds. So neonics were first registered, they were first invented in Japan in the 1990s, and then they started to uh, be sold by different uh, farm providers, uh, sorry, farm pesticide providers in 1992. The first one was imidacloprid. In 2004, so about 12 years after they were officially registered, they finally started to see an increase in use in American agriculture. In 2011, their usage doubled in a single year, and this is because at this point, these chemicals were being used as a seed coating. They were being put on the outside of corn and soybean seeds, and from 2010 to 2011, the seed manufacturers decided to double the amount of chemical that was put on the outside of that seed, even though there was no agronomic reason to. And so in 2013, long before I worked at ABC, we published a report that's called The Impact of the Nation's Most Widely Used Insecticides on Birds. Basically, it had been long enough. We'd had about 15 years of data at this point. We could start to see what impacts on wildlife might be from using these really toxic chemicals, neonicotinoids. So this is a fantastic report that Dr. Pierre Minot and my predecessor, Cynthia Palmer, put together. It's got fantastic charts and tables and predictions and policy recommendations, and very little of it went into effect. In 2015, the United States Geological Survey stopped tracking pesticide-coated seeds, and I'll go into that a little bit more in a second here, which prompted us last year, we got a little spicier in this next report, and we called it neonicotinoid insecticides, failing to come to grips with a predictable environmental disaster. So you can see we went from what the impact is to why didn't we do anything about it, and just late last year, the EPA is finally starting to examine some more impacts of neonicotinoids on birds and other wildlife. So when we're talking about impacts on birds from pesticides, there's three main ways that they might be exposed. Number one is from directly ingesting pesticides. So they might eat a caterpillar or a cricket or grasshopper that's been freshly sprayed with insecticide. If they were in an area uh, that was being sprayed, they might also eat a coated seed. When growers are out spraying, uh, some of the chemical might accidentally find its way onto a bird's skin or feathers. So that's the dermal route. And then because neonics are a special type of insecticide called systemic, that means that they are not only active when they are sprayed, it means that when they are applied to a plant, they are actually grown into every single tissue of that plant, which means that not only is the chemical application toxic, but that the uh, plant's tissues, its uh, bark or its stem or its leaves or the pollen or the nectar can all also contain this neonicotinoid insecticide. There's actually been work done in Canada on hummingbirds where they examined the, uh, their cloacal fluid and found traces of imidacloprid in it. And they think it's because the blueberry fields nearby were grown from seeds that were coated in neonicotinoids. So this is not something that gets sprayed on, dries up and goes away. This is something that makes every part of a plant toxic. And I want to talk about what this really looks like when birds are exposed. So this might be a little jarring to some folks, but this is what it looks like when these birds are exposed to insecticides. These are live uh, birds. There is a video that goes with it, but for time's sake, I'm not going to 
uh, go into that. This is a female cardinal and a gnat catcher that were both exposed. They can't hold their heads up. They're flailing around a lot. Uh, both of these birds were exposed in a backyard spray application. So there was a pest control company that came through Wisconsin and was applying neonics into backyards. Both of these birds were brought to a wildlife hospital. Uh, the female cardinal actually had eggs inside her. So that's a whole clutch of eggs that didn't make it um, to fruition. And then it also impacts raptor species like this American kestrel. I'm going to see if I can get this video to play. But if not, no problem. I'll make sure everybody gets access to the slides. What you'll see in the video is the kestrel having trouble feeding itself. Oh, good. I think we're going to see it. So this is in a little bit of a larger bodied organism, the American kestrel. And this is in a wildlife center. You can see it shaking, the beak twitching, and putting some meat right in front of its face. It's able to get it, but this is not a bird that could go out and catch a live bull or a live mouse or a live rat like they're meant to. And I wanna show this because I wanna make it very clear. When you see pesticide companies talking about the, the level of toxicity that a pesticide has, those are derived from lab studies, but those are based on how much chemical it takes to kill 50% of birds in a study. Or bees or 50% of whatever organism. That is only talking about the lethal applications. That is not talking about what happens when a bird is exposed, like this kestrel, but then survives. This is not a bird that could get out of the way of a native predator. There was also some really great work done kind of bouncing off that what's the lab like versus what's the wild um, that came out of Canada from Margaret Eng, Bridget Stutchbury, and Christy Morrissey. They captured live white crowned sparrows, brought them in different uh, concentrations of neonicotinoids. And what they found is that it actually impaired the ability to migrate. So they, they got really creative with their studies. And what they found was, you can look at these, I won't spend too much time going into them in detail, but on the left here, the graph that we're seeing is the body mass of these migratory birds after they were exposed to neonic. So the black one, you can see that's the, the baseline, that's the control, so that's a bird that was not exposed to pesticide. This red line, you can see the bird's body weight decreases drastically before eventually bouncing back up. But that takes two weeks for them to get back to that normal body weight. If you are a migratory bird, you need every single ounce of fat that you can get on your body to make sure that you are able to make it to your next safe stopping period. Two weeks out in the wild where you can't keep weight on does death for you. On the Right, we're looking at a graph that talks about their activity levels. And again, you can see in the laboratory setting, the red line, the exposure to neonicotinoid, this is a statistically significant decrease in activity. But the most interesting thing they did here, this is a, a little bit inside baseball, but it's one of my favorite things that they did in this study. There's a way that you can test the bird's migratory ability by taking a live bird putting it inside of a paper funnel with some ink at the bottom. And then over top of the bird, you either expose them to a fake night sky because some birds navigate by starlight, uh, or you can change the magnetic fields around the bird. And some birds will migrate and navigate by the Earth's magnetic fields. So they're able to artificially change which way north and south is basically to check whether birds know where they are. And going from the top down, so the top treatment here is the control. So these are birds which were not exposed to neonicotinoids. And then going down, you can see this, this red line. This is what I want you to look at on these graphs here. This shows the sort of average direction that a bird was hopping. So pre-exposure, uh, post-exposure, three and 14 days out, the birds that weren't exposed to pesticides went in roughly the same direction. With the low concentration of neonicotinoids, they went from all going in the same direction correctly to really spreading out uh, where they were hopping towards in the laboratory simulation. And then in the high exposure setting, you can see right after exposure, these birds start flying in the wrong direction. And we're not talking about insanely high amounts of pesticides. We're talking about the amount of imidacloprid that would be 
on just four canola seeds or one tenth of one corn seed in the low treatment and two tenths of one corn seed in the high treatment. And we're seeing this big of an effect. Now, one of the favorite things we did in our most recent report was Pierre Minot took and plotted all of these different test species of birds that are used by pesticide companies when they're looking at the relative toxicity of different chemicals and how basically how much it took before we saw that lethal dosage. And it makes a lot of sense. This is a pretty smooth graph. As the birds get larger in body size, so something as big as a duck all the way down to something as small as a partridge, which is a pretty little game bird, it takes more pesticide before we see those toxicity amounts. However, what they don't account for in these studies is that when you take and plot a bird's body size versus the relative toxicity, we actually find that smaller birds, so that's going to the right down here on the bottom, experience much higher toxicity in small amounts. So when you are a little bird, something like a sparrow, something like a gnat catcher, a small amount of pesticide can have worse effects on your body. And there's various theories behind that. It might be because their metabolisms are faster. Maybe they take in more food. We're not 100% sure. But if you just go off the industry studies that are based on very, very fat mallard ducks or lab-reared bobwhite quails, that does not translate to how these birds are impacted in the wild. And then talking more about neonics as a seed treatment, which is their number one use in the United States, this is actual exam seeds coated with pesticides. So I call them danger skittles and apologies to the skittles company um but i also want to point out that you don't need to worry about going to the hardware store to buy bird feed to fill up your feeders you are legally not allowed to buy pesticide coated seed or to sell pesticide coated seed as a human or an animal feed so unless your sunflowers or safflower looks like that it's not coated in a neonic but the graph on the right shows that same time period of neonicotinoid usage their introduction all the way up until 2014. You can see introduced in 94, nobody really cared till 2004, and then their use exploded. And when they were being marketed, neonics were supposed to be the great replacement. Once you start using them, you don't have to use anything else because they're so gosh darn toxic. However, if you look at the graph on the bottom, it's the same time period for all other insecticides that neonics were supposed to be replacing. If they were doing what they were marketed to do, we should see that as neonic use goes up, the rest of the usage goes down. But instead, we don't really see a significant change in other pesticides while neonics are being used. So it's an in addition to chemical rather than an in place of chemical. And the federal government does publish some pesticide use data. Uh, this is for a neonicotinoid clothianidin in 2014. You can see where it's used. Lots of places that grow corn and soybeans. But the United States Geological Survey said that in 2014, it was so hard for them to track how neonics were used as seed coatings, the number one usage, that they just stopped altogether. They said it's way too hard. They're not legally considered pesticides because they're on a seed which is a whole other argument that we can have. And so if you look at the next year, it almost looks like neonics disappeared overnight. We're hardly using clothianidin. This is the same data represented on the map on the right down here on the bottom. And you can see it looks like in 2015, it just disappeared altogether. But that's because you can see we don't see these yellow corn bars anymore. We stopped tracking their use as a seed coating. They're still there. We're just not counting them anymore. And this does have further reaching problems. So one of the things that the EPA is supposed to do is decide how a pesticide might impact an endangered species. And they haven't been doing that. They've had the pants suit off of them for a long time now. And they're, they're starting to slowly uh, get up on that horse and start to do some of this work. But what they're finding is that because of these gaps in data, there's certain risk assessments they can't do. When they were looking at the Atwater's prairie chicken, one of the most endangered birds in the United States, what they're finding is that they can do risk assessments based on how neonics are sprayed, but there are huge data gaps that they admit in the assessment, such as for use as a seed treatment. And by the way, a lot of the same effects that we see on birds have also been recorded in 
white-tailed deer in experimental and wild settings, as well as mink, as well as some pregnant humans uh, when they've looked at farm workers. So this is not just a bird problem. And I also want to talk about how important insects are to birds. And we do a lot of work with the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation. They did a study in the Netherlands in 2014, and they saw that the only correlate between bird declines in these given areas was the use of neonicotinoid insecticides. It wasn't where they were planting or how much urban area, it was the use of neonics. And they'd surmised from looking at all the information that the neonics themselves weren't killing the birds. The neonics were getting into the water system. The neonics were killing the mayflies and the caddisflies and all the beneficial aquatic inverts that were not supposed to be targeted and thus depriving birds of food. And when there are fewer bugs, there's less food for birds. It's that simple. They might then turn to less than optimal diets, such as uh, less, less nutritious um, food sources from plants. In some cases, they will then stop eating bugs and start eating more seed, which could be pesticide-coated seed. There's some anecdotal evidence of that. They have to go further from their home ranges when they're nesting to forage, which means less time and less trips to go back and feed their babies. And while they're out there foraging further, they're subject to increased predation, both by native predators like Cooper's hawks and by introduced predators such as wild domestic cats. So if there's less bugs in the areas that the birds are trying to hunt in, there's all of these cascading impacts. And this uh, infographic that I have here on the left is just one of the ones that we've had made in response or uh, with the help of our 2023 report, all the different ways that birds might be negatively impacted. These available free on the ABC website. And what are we doing about it? So here's where it starts to get a little bit happier. So one of the things that we have started to work on is challenging the specific part of federal pesticide law that says, if you coat a seed in a pesticide, it is no longer legally considered a pesticide. It is now what's called a treated article. This was a provision that was written so that lumber manufacturers and people that make boat paint did not have to register lumber that had a pesticide in it as a pesticide. It has now been inappropriately, in our opinion, applied to pesticide-coated seeds, which means that if you are spraying neonics on a field, you have to abide by the label, you have to report any misuse, you have to be subject to the federal laws governing that. But if you apply the very same chemical in much greater volumes as a seed coating, where you put it directly in the ground, where it gets washed off into waterways, you are no longer using a pesticide. So in 2017, we were represented by the Center for Food Safety, and we sued the EPA, trying to get them to reinterpret the treated article exemption. EPA sat on their hands. In 2021, a new lawsuit was brought challenging the exact same thing. They finally had to issue a statement where essentially they said, we feel like we do a good enough job with neonics when we register the chemical coating, not the seed coating. So they basically said, we're doing a fine job, leave us alone. We don't love that. So we are now working with the Center for Food Safety and the Pesticide Action Network of North America to sue them again under the same statute for uh, denying our original petition. So we are trying to get neonicoted seeds to at least be subject to the same laws that govern all other pesticides in the United States. Another uh, great One Health tie-in here is that when these neonic seeds are planted, the coating that is on them actually comes off as dust where it's carried away by wind and also inhaled by farm workers. And there are lots of upcoming chances for engagement if you wanna really get involved on the nitty gritty side of things. So there is an advance notice of proposed rulemaking for pesticide coated seeds. There is uh, new regulations. There, there are new regulations that the Fish and Wildlife Service has released specifically governing agriculture on the National Wildlife Refuge System. And there's also a new biological in which the EPA consults with other federal agencies to find out how damaging the current use of a pesticide might be. 
And after they go through and talk to Fish and Wildlife and the National Marine Fisheries Service, they're also supposed to go through um, uh, Health and Human Services and do what's called an endocrine disruptor screening program, where they look at neurotoxic chemicals and find out if they interfere in human endocrine systems. And then after all of that happens, they issue a new set of mitigations on that chemical. There are 1,000 or so active ingredients registered in the United States. There are 12,000 products that use those active ingredients. And there have been to date a whopping total of two, only two biological opinions that have ever been completed. And that endocrine disruptor screening program has been dormant for about 10 years. The EPA last fall announced that they are finally restarting it. So they are taking some very positive steps. There's also a lot happening at the state level. A lot of the states around PA have some really great regulations uh, and laws that they're trying to put into effect. These are just the states where I'm currently working. Minnesota has a non-agricultural neonicotinoid ban, so banning their use in lawns and golf courses. There's also a treated, screen, a treated seed prescription program that's being proposed. In Vermont, there's a similar program. California is very progressive in these areas, but they still have a long way to go because they have a lot of agriculture there. Uh, Connecticut and Washington also have rodenticide legislation on the books, and um, they're working to strengthen it. And there's also some new laws governing the use of neonicotinoids. And here's why I have a lot of hope. This is reason number one. New York State last year finally published a or finally passed a law called the Birds and Bees Protection Act, which I have to say, it's a blast to walk into a legislator's office and say you're here to talk about the birds and bees. That's one of the great joys of my job. Uh, but the Birds and Bees Protection Act would actually phase out the use of neonix as a seed coating on corn, soy, and wheat by 2029. They're the first state ever to have done this with a legislative process. It also gets rid of non-agricultural uses of neonicotinoids by 2027. This will cut down on the amount of backyard exposures to people and wildlife. There are still wide exemptions that could happen in there in case the Department of Environmental Conservation needs to tackle a new pest, or in case you are a grower that can't find uncoated seeds, they can still help you out. Uh, the original timelines of this bill were much closer. They got moved back right before the governor signed it, but we're glad to have this law on the books. There is also a fabulous new regulation passed in California at the state level. We petitioned them in 2017, so before I worked at ABC, um, and then this started to pick up steam two years ago. I've spent a lot of time in state fish and game commission hearings trying to get them to acknowledge our petition. And finally, just about a month and a half or about a month ago, they published a new rule that says neonics cannot be used on state owned land. So that state parks, state forests, um, state recreation areas are no longer allowed to use neonicotinoids in California. And that's directly as a result of the advocacy we and Earth Justice did with all of our fantastic supporters in California. And here's the main reason why I'm so hopeful, especially for birds. This is a graph of the amount of breeding pairs in a particular species of bird over time. And I'm wondering if anybody can guess what it might be. Think of America. Think of our, our national symbol, if you will. You guessed it. It's the bald eagle. Bald eagles were originally uh, put in jeopardy because of DDT, another very widely used, highly toxic, highly employed insecticide that we didn't know was bad, quote unquote, for a very long time. DDT was finally banned in 1973. And one year later, the bald eagle was finally put on the Endangered Species Act. They were almost wiped off the face of the earth in North America. But because people listened to scientists, they talked to their legislators, this ban was put on the books. In 2002, there was a global ban on DDT. So it still took a few years for it to work its way out of the global system. And then 
In just 2009, the bald eagle was finally, or sorry, 2007, the bald eagle was taken off the endangered species list. The chemical, which was threatening them, was gotten rid of, and we were actually able to see their populations rebound. You can see how quickly they picked up steam once the right controls were put in place, and we were able to take them off the endangered species list. This is the goal of conservation. There's nobody that works around endangered species or threatened species of birds or any other wildlife that says, I want to do this forever. I always want these species to be in decline. The goal is to get them back to a point where they are no longer sitting on the precipice of extinction. And we've seen this happen in the past with the different insecticides. So I'm very hopeful that we can do it again. And my biggest message to everybody is don't be afraid to reach out to your representatives and to your government. Reach out to me. I'm happy to help you craft messaging and kind of point you in the right direction. This is what I do for a living, and I'm very, very lucky that I get to do it. So I, again, I apologize for such a rocky start. I know there was a lot of information crammed in there, but I so enjoyed talking to you all. And I believe we have plenty of time for some questions, if anybody has some. Absolutely. Folks, please go ahead and put your, your questions into either the chat or the Q&A. Uh, we do have one that's in the Q&A right now, uh, and that is from Monica. And she says, apologies if this was brought up, but when was the LD50 concept first implemented for these experiments? Thank you. Great question, Monica. Um, I also changed my virtual background to this goofy picture of me, so you can all at least see what I look <laughs> like. So that's me normally. Um, so the LD50, LD50 is short for lethal dose 50%. That is a concept that was first described in the late 40s when the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act was getting off its feet. And then it was really popularized in the 50s and 60s as sort of the gold standard of how chemicals are measured and mitigated. So LD50 applies to any organism that is tested in a laboratory. Birds, mammals, which is usually rats or mice, invertebrates, which are typically uh, bees, and then an aquatic invertebrate called uh, Daphnia. Daphnia magna is used as the surrogate for all aquatic invertebrates. And the testing standard was developed with the thought that it was conservative enough. If you killed 50% of a representative population, that's, that's the mean uh, lethal level that we should be talking about. Again, what it doesn't take into account is what happens to the sublethal dosing or synergistic effects when you have multiple chemicals that um, an, an organism might be exposed to simultaneously. So LD50 is used as the gold standard because nobody's really come up with anything better quite yet. And it's also very tricky because almost all of the toxicity studies and the toxicity endpoint studies that the EPA uses when it's recommending how to mitigate a chemical come from the chemical manufacturers themselves. I'm not saying, and I'm not fully insinuating that, you know, there's, there's any impropriety there. They have amazing uh, scientific setups at these uh, chemical companies. They use a lot of universities to do a lot of this testing when they don't have the facilities. It's just, typically not representative of what actually happens in the wild. And we have a couple of other questions here. Uh, so right. this is from Haley. Do other countries have similar levels of neonic issues? If so, uh, are there any legislation regulating those uh, uses in those countries? Fabulous question. Yes. Um, so other other countries, even other continents, I would venture to say, have similar levels of neonics. <clears throat> In South America, their pesticide use isn't as well reported, so we don't have great data on that. But in the European Union, they were starting to see massive insect declines, massive uh, bee die-offs, and neonics, as well as a few other chemicals, were selected as sort of the most likely culprit and so Europe has banned, or the European Union, I should say, has banned the use of neonicotinoids in outdoor settings starting in 2018. And there has not been a massive crash in the amount of crops produced in the EU uh, since that has happened. That full ban went into effect just in 
2021. And it, it was a shift in what growers had access to. Absolutely. There were farmers that had to rethink what chemicals they applied to their crops. But I think the important thing to realize is we have not heard any tales of famine coming out of Europe. So it's usually the case with these things. The EU acted. They saw the writing on the wall. The U.S. is several years behind, but we also don't like to do what Europe does for some reason. So uh, we're a bit behind there. Um, Asia is also seeing pretty high levels of neonics in their citizens. There's some great papers in China that document uh, rising neonic levels in communities around farms uh, in large agricultural areas, but there's really been no efforts to curb their use there. Kind of following up on that, Hardy, uh, am yeah. I correct that you said that this, this, these chemicals actually came from Japan originally? Is that true? Yeah, yeah, they were first developed in Japan. There's a lot of great chemical innovation that happens there. The Japanese don't use them a ton because their agricultural systems aren't quite as intense or monocultured as the United States are. So a lot of chemicals developed in Japan really get their footing in American ag markets. That's, that's quite convenient, isn't it? <laughs> it sure is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Calvin has a, a question. He says that uh, the Raptor Trust is near where he lives and is wondering if uh, ABC works with the Raptor Trust. Hey, Calvin. Yes, we do. The, the Raptor Trust are great friends of ours. We work with them on some rodenticide issues. And New Jersey actually had one of the country's first neonicotinoid restricting laws passed there in 2000. And 20, I believe, or 2019. So yeah, Raptor Trust is really great work. Glad that you glad that you know about them. Anonymous has a question. Uh, were there any extensive testing on these insecticides? It seems like organizations act first and fix later. Uh, why weren't there any tests on how it would affect the environment first? Yeah, yeah. So th this is the tricky thing with chemicals that are used in the United States. There are new chemicals that will be developed. They are lab tested. They are not extensively field tested. The general understanding with how pesticide uh, testing works is once it clears the laboratory testing and the label is developed by EPA, the label is the law, is the saying when it comes to pesticides. It's deployed out in the field. It's put into agricultural markets. It's put into lawn care markets. It's put into indoor pest control markets. And then a few years go by, we start to gather some data to see how it's used and can inform uh, new studies and new mitigations. Technically, the government only has to re-evaluate these chemicals once every 15 years. They are behind on about, even so, when they do reevaluate, they have to look at any of these studies. The EPA has discretion on what studies they consider. So it's it's difficult. Um, it's hard because laboratory settings is not quite like the wild. And uh, even if we put really great mitigations on them based on what we know in labs, it doesn't mean it's going to translate to the real world. So there has been extensive testing done on these insecticides. I just don't think it's the right kind of testing. It's not as representative as it needs to be. And now that we have a lot more information, that's what we need to be considering in to um, all of the lab testing that the chemical companies have submitted. So it, it can't be an either or, it has to be a both and. Hardy, I don't know if you broke up for everybody else, but I, I kind of lost you when you were saying how many years have to pass before reevaluation, was it 15 years? Yes, I apologize. Yeah, 15 years in between okay. uh, chemical registrations. Okay, I just wanted to clear that up for in case yeah. anyone else had the issue too. KCS, if you had to see, this is kind of an interesting question, if you had to see either seed coating or spray application removed in the U.S., which would you think would benefit birds more? Casey, you have hit the nail on the head. This this is the summation of basically all the work I've done for the last uh, two years. I'd, I'd first like to go on record and say both, definitely, with uh, maybe some caveats in there for emerging pest threats. But if I had to pick between one of those uh, two things, definitely the seed coatings need to go. They are used... Um, 
just to put some numbers on it, neonic seed coatings are used on virtually 100% of corn, uh, somewhere between 50 and 80% of soybeans, somewhere between 60 and 70% of cotton, somewhere between uh, 20 and 40% of squash and cucurbits that are grown in the United States, almost all sugar beets, almost all potatoes, I mean, you you name it, and they're used there, but they're not tracked, they're not regulated, they're not uh, as enforceable as the spray application. So I don't think either is good. I don't think either is necessary in most cases, but definitely got to get rid of the seed coatings first. That's that's my answer. So Hardy, one thing that struck me is if if we have the seed coating, and then we do have yeah. Uh, insecticides that are being sprayed and we see no reduction in the use of insecticides even with the seed coating yeah <laughs> what what's driving the economics of sticking with both when really yeah. you're still doing uh you know thinking that one is supposed to be this great savior and yet you're still sticking with both Yeah, yeah, good, excellent question. It's they are sold as an insurance measure. So the idea is you don't you probably don't need these, but just in case, why don't we throw a seed coating on the corn seed or the soybean soybean seed or whatever seed that you're buying and uh we're going to put it on your crops and that way, you know, you've got that you've got that extra peace of mind there. They are not, you don't have to report always that you're putting it on those seeds when you sell it to someone. Uh, the most recent surveys indicate that around 40% of growers don't even know that the seeds that they're buying have a neonic on them. They know that they're coated. They know that there's something on them. They know that, uh, you know, a soybean seed is in bubblegum pink, but they don't know that there's a neonicotinoid on them. And the idea is that it's just extra peace of mind. And uh, tying into Olivia's question, is there any kind of integrated pest management that can help rather than use the seed coating? That's the big issue is these chemicals are used as seed coatings on crops that are planted at times of year when the pests that the seed coatings would actually help with aren't even active. They are planted in soil types where you don't, don't have a big issue with uh, nematodes or something feeding on the, the seedlings, or they're planted at a time of year when the pest that they would be targeting, something like a sucking aphid, um, isn't even active. So you're adding these chemicals to the seed and effectively the environment and getting no benefit in return, but you are still paying for it. Uh, the EPA actually did it in 2014 and found that there is no economic advantage to using a seed coating on soybeans. They were supposed to do it on corn seeds as well, but that got shut down by the agricultural lobby. So no one ever did uh, um, that, that kind of uh, investigation. Their continued use is the chemical companies have the seed dealers tell people that this is something that you need and it's applied and used without growers knowing about it or without growers being given the option to say no. The assumption is just it's going to be there. Well, we are we are pretty much out of time. And I, I just wanted to say a couple of things, and then I'm going to allow Anonymous's question to kind of go forward here. But uh, for all of you out there, first of all, I strongly recommend that you go to ABC's website and look at the report. Uh, I was first drawn to this report when it came out in 2023, and that's why Hardy is here now, because I immediately reached out and was like to ABC, can somebody come and talk to One Health about this? Uh, because I think this is such an important issue. The other thing I'd like to point out is, you know, Hardy's talking about what he does in going and meeting with legislators and letting them know uh, the concerns that ABC has about this, you can do the same thing and you should do the same thing. You are a citizen, people are there, your state representatives, your federal representatives and senators are there for you. If they don't hear from you, they're not listening to you. 
Uh, you know, you may not see the action that you want to see immediately, uh, but certainly you need to keep yourself in there. Uh, when you learn things, uh, pass on that information. You know, it's, uh, it's going to do a lot of good. Uh, I'm sure there's thousands of other questions, but just to kind of wrap this up, Hardy, uh, Anonymous asks, how did you get into this field? What drives you about this cause? Anonymous, yes, thank you. And thank you so much for uh, the, the words, Reg. I completely agree. I, I talk to your representatives. I'm happy to help you do it. I spent my life in animal care. So my first career was as a zookeeper, getting really close to wildlife. And what I loved was building the connection between people and animals and how they can help them. And I've always had a deep respect for the role that the government can play and that our legislators can play in making these big decisions. And I was lucky enough to, to get a master's degree in public administration, where I learned a lot more about how public policy is developed. And then I started looking around for jobs and there was this one open at American Bird Conservancy. And I, I love talking to people. I love complicated topics. I've gotten a lot better at Scrabble since I started working on chemicals because the names are so complicated. But what's really interesting to me is it's the story of DDT. We listened to scientists. We saw what was happening. We talked to legislators. We made a change. And we have a lot more species because of it. So I am the luckiest person on earth in that I get to be the bridge between people, wildlife, and change makers. And I'm also in a lot of rooms where there will be 50, 60 people from agricultural interests and chemical companies, and one or two people from the environmental side of things will say, and our voices are heard equally by the people up at the front, by the people making decisions. So I, I love that I get to have this role and I don't at all want to vilify uh, growers. You know, we need, we need food. We desperately need food. We need what farmers do. I just think there's a better way to do it so that we can keep people, wildlife, ecosystems, and humans a lot safer and birds, of course. So I, I thank you all so much for the opportunity to be here today. I know I crammed a lot into our short time together, so I'm happy blow up and uh, share some of the resources that we have. Great. Thank you, Hardy. And thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. Uh, I I think that I've learned a great deal from this and uh, am looking forward to, to having people who follow up with you and follow up with the report. Uh, and again, at some point, I hope that we get a chance to meet. I also came out of the zoo world uh, and am now teaching. Uh, so there's there's always this passion that drives us in being able to to make a difference here, I hope. Thank you, Hardy. Thank you, Definitely. everybody. Have a great Thank night. Thank you all. Good night.